Doktor Doreen Juhasauer, która jest doświadczoną nauczycielką, osobą bardzo aktywną w swojej społeczności lokalnej, współpracującą z Uniwersytetem Stanowym w Ohio, a jednocześnie osobą, która w roku 2003 została nauczycielem roku w stanie Ohio. Lecz skalę stanu Ohio to tak trochę mniejszy niż Polska. Także to tak Tytuł dosyć znaczący. Zapraszam. To się dobrze. I must admit to you that um, I am not an honest woman. I am. Um, a woman who comes to you with less than educational credentials. And um, I want to explain that to you because I think that I owe you that explanation. Um, I am not a professor of teaching and learning. I am not an educational psychologist. I am not a supervisor. I am not a um, lecturer of pre-service teachers, although I've had many student teachers in 40 years of teaching. I am not an evaluator. I am uh, not an educational consultant. So you may be wondering why I am here. Um, I am not a principal. I am not a superintendent of schools, um, nor would I consider playing one on television, even if I were asked. Um, but I have done evaluations in the classroom. I have led programs in public policy and social um, media and in civic education. And um, when I do observe teachers in classrooms, in history especially, I am very thankful that sometimes there is not a bubble that appears over my head that says what I'm thinking. What is that teacher thinking? Um, so I try very hard not to be judgmental. My greatest achievement, I think, may be that I have been in the classroom and that I have enjoyed the classroom for 40 years and that I have done as many years in classroom, cafeteria duty, and playground duty and still survived. Um, I have to tell you that my background uh, is not, as I said, in education, um, but it is in medieval and Reformation history. So I am really a sort of a church historian and a medievalist. Um, the classroom has always been my not so secret passion. Everyone who knows me knows that I am very comfortable in the classroom and enjoy students. But they do not know is that I am also my other passion is church history and medieval history. And these two things do not necessarily go together. It is as if one thing enters my brain through one way and the other through the other, and then they don't even say hello to each other. Um, but lately, they seem to come together more and more. In the past 10 years, um, I have come more and more to see that these two interests, teaching high school, and church history have a way of walking together. And there's now a common discourse between the two. And I think that in perhaps it's because for the last 10 years, there has been an obsession in the United States about evaluation. And there is nothing like evaluation to make you think about medieval history. I will avoid the usual parallels. Uh, external state evaluators may not necessarily be like the Spanish Inquisition, although I tend generally to think of them in the same terms. But having a medieval history background does, in a way, make things useful, sometimes humorous, and much more comforting. And so um, I was struck at the invitation to this conference by a remark that Dr. Mazukevich had in his opening paper, his invitation. He said, in the distant past, school was considered good when first thought of uh, what it was considered good if students just learned to read and write. Now, I am in medieval history, so if people talk to me about the past, I have very certain prejudices about that. I am quick to defend things in the past. And so I'm not sure that I agree with Dr. Manzukiewicz that 
and I think perhaps his statement with apologies was simplistic and perhaps a little shallow. But because the history of public education in the United States is very rich, the irony is we never teach children about it, so they don't know about that. But then I started to think more about the history of public education in the United States, and perhaps I do have to agree that there are some medieval qualities about it. Education in the United States 100 years ago was good. If you could learn Greek, you could quote Shakespeare and the Bible, and you promise to grow up and be just like Abraham Lincoln or George Washington. So to be a white male was definitely an advantage in the school system. But I do resist the urge to agree with people when they say the past is bad, the present is good, and the future is better, because that to me just hurts my feelings as a person, as a medievalist. But for the sake of the argument of what I'm going to present to you as a metaphor, I must admit, I will try to become a recovering medievalist with a 12-step program similar to Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, in the United States, during the years of uh, uh, changes in evaluation, uh, we should have known that there were many changes ahead when President Bush introduced into Congress, and it had bipartisan support, the idea that now children were more accountable. One of the first things that we really noticed was this thing that grew out of the State Department of Education building. It was a little red schoolhouse, a one-room schoolhouse that now sits there sort of oddly coming out of a building in Washington, D.C. It's as if it's there that had arrived by a tornado from the Wizard of Oz and just sat there. And I think it was to remind us that somehow this myth of old school uh, on the prairie was a better time. And so, yes, of course it was a better time. There was one overworked, underpaid teacher who was probably a woman, 30 or more students of at least eight grade levels, shared books, and uh, part of the duties of the teacher was, of course, to stoke the fire and clean and be boarded by parents. So, yes, I guess, looking back, this was an ideal situation for President George Bush uh, for looking at education. But the No Child Left Behind challenge was really, and this is sort of the beginning of my metaphor, was really much more like Martin Luther in 16th century Germany tacking the thesis on the church door. Uh, when the No Child Left Behind Act came, it was very much like Martin Luther issuing a challenge to the medieval world. Uh, and the world was considered to be turned upside down. And that is a common phrase in the Reformation. Uh, to say that no child left behind would become the law of the land was suddenly to mean that there would be standards, testing, and one-size-fits-all evaluation. As it, as it turned out, um, the uh, peculiar and often narrow interpretations of the standards which were created, I will call the doctrine. So they were like a church doctrine. And evaluations became like the Apostles' Creed. We would pledge that that was the doctrine. And it would be on what the testing was based. And the doctrine, in order for it to work, had to be perfectly aligned to what was going to be asked on the test. And so there could not be any other teaching that was going on. And so I refer to these as the heresies. There was to be no issues-based education. There was not to be service learning. There was not to be social justice concerns. Uh, certainly, we were not really going to teach about sex education in schools. It was much more important to do reading and writing and math. And social studies definitely also took uh, sort of a backdoor approach. And um, all of the things that were not essential to the testing were looked at as if they were suddenly Marxist leftist politics, and they were the heresies, and they were out. Just like in the time of Martin Luther, reformers begot, and I always love that word, it's an Old Testament word, begot, another generation. Reformers begot more reformers. And after a while, what was pretty easy to see was that um, 
what we needed to have to survive all of this was a correct curriculum. And the correct curriculum was like the catechism. It would save us all. If we could just figure out what the questions were and make this part of the catechism, we would all be saved. Teachers, we were being blamed for what had happened in the past. It was our academic freedom that allowed this to all happen. How dare we teach things that could not be tested in the eyes sometimes of the government? Well, if we were not to be all saved, maybe at least the children's souls would be and a few teachers' jobs. Meanwhile, I, I have another analogy to put in here. I don't know how many of you are familiar with or enjoy, you have to consider my generation here, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Monty Python is the English satire um, team, and they made uh, a satire of the Middle Ages. And in one particular scene in Monty Python, knights come riding through the English countryside, and they find a group of peasants who are working in the field, and they say, where is your leader? Where is your king? And they look up and they say, we have a leader? We have a king? Nobody told us we had a leader or a king. We always thought we were an autonomous collective. We just do this by ourselves. And that is kind of the position teachers were in. They kept their head down, their eyes on the potatoes or on ungraded papers, and they waited for the reform movement to move on and on and on. When the initial um, shock of the first reform movements passed, as I said, there were other reformers, and with all due apologies to my colleagues who are from the university, many of them really came from universities, other reformers, and they said things like, uh, you know, no, it's this approach, this approach, this approach. And again, like the Reformation, this was suddenly like not having Lutherans anymore, but now we had Sphingliites and Hooterites and Calvinists and the counter-reformers, and the Jesuits, and any, anyone who broke away from the public and private school in the United States to form the charter school movement were like Episcopalians. The charter school movement are public schools which take public money, call themselves public schools, but do not have to conform to um, other requirements. They do not need to reveal their budgets. They do not need to reveal who are the people on their boards, and they do not have to hire qualified teachers or principals. What they do very well is to take money from the state and thereby drain the resources away from other schools which just become poorer and poorer. Um, to, uh, to kind of conclude this tortured analogy uh, um, and kind of move on here a bit, Let's pretend for a moment that the medieval world is officially sort of gone. And whether we are uh, saying this um, educational practices today are mythologically bad or mythologically good, our world has been turned upside down by conservatives and neoconservatives and traditionalists and anarchists and uh, probably modernists. Uh, every school of thought about education has emerged on the American public. In the uh, Reformation, in art and in woodcut blocks of the Reformation, it was sometimes popular to show how much the world had actually turned upside down by taking a small animal that is considered gentle, like a rabbit, and showing them in a new light. And so rabbits now in woodcuts became like they were vicious animals. They were attacking people. They were bloodthirsty. And this idea of the rabbit turning a, into a, a, a creature of blood was frightening to people in the, in the Reformation. For us today, otherwise gentle people, gentle, normal, and even kind people, sometimes do still viciously attack each other on educational doctrine, and they play the blame game on evaluation. Who is responsible for the evaluations and the poor scores? the child whose test scores um, did not rise, the evaluator uh, who did not put the right question on the test, the range-finding team who saw the results and wondered if the test was too easy, the teachers who feared the test, 
the principal who, when all else falls, everything comes to the principal's desk, including probably vicious rabbits. Um, who was responsible? The politicians who either would pretend to lie, to pretend to love, or pretend to hate the test, depending on who they were talking about. Um, who taught the children more? I, this came up in a session. Do parents bl take blame, or do the teachers? Who teaches the child more? Is society responsible? Who allowed this child to be born in poverty, and this child to be born in the middle class with middle class advantages? And worse yet, who allowed that child to be born to rich parents? Because rich parents could put their child in a private school, hire an educational specialist who would certify the child had some disorders and they would need more time on their college entrance exams, whether it was true or not. There is a whole industry in California, which I think is devoted to helping children of rich parents get into colleges by assuming they have some cognitive disorders. And who allowed the consultants in? I think Dr. Nazarkiewicz's opening slide about do we need a consultant to tell us that we're on fire was a very good one. The medieval world has been called by historians a world lit by fire. And so now the question is, have the embers finally burned out and the old ways are finally gone? At the beginning of the conference, one of the presenters raised the question, what do people need to hear? How can they be mobilized to not just evaluate education, but mobilize the changing uh, needs of education? How do we change education for a world 20 years from now? Dr. McBeath said, start by doing one or two things differently. Change, change the culture in order to enable change to grow. Do something different to motivate change. Dr. Godelli wisely questioned, what does global even mean? Is it about competition in a global market for jobs? Or as Dr. Lynch noted emphatically, we are in a war of ideas, and students are not customers like shoe shoppers. It is not all about the economics. I once, allowed, or I once asked students, my students, why they were going to go to college. And to a student, they answered the same answer, because we will make more money. And I said, how do you know? And they said, because everyone tells us we will make more money. What do you think, Mrs. Johas Sauer? And I said, well, yes, you probably will make more money. But it will also be the only time in your life when you will have the luxury of exchanging ideas with other people. And that will be exciting. It will be stimulating, and it will be something you will remember when you are 50 years old, what college was like because you exchanged ideas. And they looked at me absolutely stunned, as if no one had ever said this. And in fact, they said, we never thought about that we learn ideas in college. Uh, we have been wisely cautioned by the presenters to carefully think about what certain terms mean, global, quality, evaluation, what do they imply? And what about equity and equality? They came up last night. Uh, I would challenge you with two other questions. It's about technology. What is, if technology is a tool, what is the tool supposed to do? It is not a discrete subject in and of itself, and yet we add it on to everything as if it were something magical. And the other one is, when is the last time you had a conversation at your dinner table or with your colleagues in school and asked people what they thought democracy meant? And if they can talk about democracy, on what is a citizen then? We just don't have the luxury of these conversations. I'm sure they don't. They may happen among social studies teachers. But try to get the math teacher to think about what is democracy. Before I share with you a small snapshot of what is happening in my world, I want to tell you about my world, meaning the city that I'm from. And because there were decisions made to make change, not for change's sake, but because the Reformation had come to our door. And so it was important to know 
what is the community like? Because each community is different, and evaluations will be done in a community. Your children are part of the community. The uh, schools are part of the community. And when you judge them, you are judging the community. Columbus, Ohio is a governmental center for the state of Ohio. And though by where it sits geographically in the middle of the state, it uh, is kind of in the middle of cornfields, too, it de actually developed relatively early compared to other places by the end of the 18th century. For us, it's, that's a long time. It was the crossroads. Uh, it was where Indian trails crossed, later the National Road, the road people took to go west for the, for the uh, gold rush came through Columbus. There was a linkage of canals. There were crosses of railroads. And it, but it's not an industrial city. It is not like living in Chicago, Cleveland, where I am from originally, Detroit, or Pittsburgh. It was almost before World War II, it was before World War II almost a small town. But it was poised for change. In the beginning of the 19th century, it was filled with Irish and Germans who, who uh, left for the potato famine and left the revolutions of 1848 in Europe, Welsh, Hungarians, Croatians, and French Huguenots, and early settlements of free African Americans. Uh, they included even President Thomas Jefferson's own children. Well, most of you probably know he had both a white and an African American family. Protestant independent thinkers, many Catholics, and conservative Jews were all in the area in the first 30 years when the area was being settled and the last of the Indian tribes were leaving. The, Sha uh, the Shawnee and the Wyandotte were being forced out of Ohio. So it has always been sort of an odd mixture of many different uh, nationalities and ethnic groups. Why is this important? Well, I think it's important because Although those people are dead and they are gone, we are really not a melting pot as a community. Uh, each new group may develop some cultural amnesia. They forget their roots a bit, but it's as if there is a living DNA within the community that keeps defining civic values. And I think this may be true for many places, even if the populations do change. There is a myth of cultural adaptation that we want to all become like each other. And it's really not true. Each community will keep its own character. And sometimes we'll evaluate ourselves on that basis. Um, what did we look like in the past? Did we get along with each other? Um, as a community, how do we act when we think we are at our best? And this is what becomes very interesting to me, is it's part of perhaps a, an odd American uh, pedagogy. But even studies done of children who have recently arrived and who may be illegal immigrants who are in schools for just a few months and they are starting to learn about American history, when they are interviewed, they refer to themselves as the people in American history. They will say things like, when we signed the Mayflower Compact, when we fought the American Revolution, when we fought the Civil War. They have so identified with what they see is American history as they know it that they put themselves into it. Um, in Columbus, we think we look our best. And I believe me, this is my non-scientific but scientific, I guess, uh, evaluation of the city. We think we look our best when we are polite, when we are rational, when we're caring, and when we show equal racial and gender balance on government, boards, and in all sorts of business relations. So if you looked at our seven city council people who are elected, you might find two black women, two white men, you know, two black men, one white man. Suddenly, it's as if it was all done by magic. They just represent that distribution. The Board of Education is very much the same way. Uh, in um, Cleveland, which is uh, you know not very far away, uh, about 250 miles to the north, it is not unusual, or was not in the past, to have a city council meeting in which people threw chairs at each other. You would think they were the Japanese parliament suddenly breaking into fistfights. That would never happen 
in Columbus, there is a, a if, whether it's a facade or an ingrained value, there is a politeness about civil discourse. 150 years ago, the American Civil War started, which is being observed in April in many communities. And at that time, Columbus was considered to be, this may surprise you, a southern Are we okay? Are we okay? Thank you. Columbus was considered a southern city. We are nowhere located in the south, but because southerners had come up into this area and settled it, the city was known for its gentility and its southern manners. And southerners who came north could not bring their slaves. They were forbidden. So they suddenly made them their servants, and they paid them a wage because what was important to those Southerners was not the cheap labor of slavery, but the cheap land of Ohio. So they made a trade-off, and thereby that introduces another factor in the Columbus mentality, and that is we are at our best when our interest is there for us to uh, be able to use in a, in a wise way. Um, the custom of the gentle and the polite democracy is very observable in Columbus politics, in our polite civil discourse. Um, Columbus is a very liberal town located in the middle of rural conservative America. It is the highest donor outside of San Francisco to gay, lesbian, transgender causes uh, in terms of actual dollars and charity given for those movements, as I said, large, only second only to San Francisco and actually larger than even the givings of New York City. Um, Columbus then has always been a crossroads city and much of its present, pa present population was not actually ever born there. They, they bring the values with them and then they adopt the values of the community. It has the second largest Somali population in the United States. The city is actually now the largest in Ohio and is the only city in, Colum in Ohio that is still growing. In the 1960s, Cleveland was the seventh largest city in the United States and Columbus was not even in the top 50. Today, Cleveland has a population of only about 300,000 people and has 43,000 abandoned and vacant homes. Columbus is not only growing, it has 10,000 new condos and housing units in a 10 square block downtown with 2,000 more coming on. There are 10 colleges and universities in the area and the largest is Ohio State with 55,000 students. It is not industrial, but it makes its money in education, pharmaceuticals, insurance, service industries, banking, scientific research, government, and communication. But Columbus, like other cities, has a, has a disturbing, dirty little secret, and that is the growing disparity between young people who come to Columbus for a college education and young people who are born in the city who live in the shadow of a university and cannot read and write. The population is becoming poor and it is becoming more minority as over the years public policies have created segregated housing and segregated schools and around Columbus are white and wealthy suburbs to which middle-class families, both white and black, will decide to leave Columbus schools and to move. This public policy decisions of 70 years ago still face us today. The school currently has 53,000 students, so it's still very large. It is the 17th largest school district in the United States. It, um, although it has lost 30,000 students to charter schools. It is 50%, 51% male, 49% female. 60% um, of the population are African-American. 28% are white. 
6% are Hispanic, um, 2% are Asian, and 5% identify themselves as mixed race, which also tells you, because this is new in the census for the United States, that in coming years, more people may identify themselves as mixed race, which is now just becoming perhaps a, a more acceptable alternative that was not there before. 12% of the children in Columbus um, come from homes where English is not spoken, and they speak in Columbus 89 different languages, and that does not include dialects, 89 languages. 77% live below the poverty line. So it, by federal standards, it is not a rich community. It is still very hard for me to believe that children do grow up next to a university and cannot read and write, and yet that is not unusual. It happens. When No Child Left Behind came in, systematic evaluations, mostly wrong-headed in their obsession to score just the multiple-choice test answer, revealed, no surprise, children did not know the answers. The unintended consequence of rushing to the test that was multiple choice to show what you knew was going to be there, the children didn't have answers because so much in the United States research shows that low-income students have never had the advantages of middle-class students. They have no contextual background for even understanding the subjects in some cases. But once those test scores started to be revealed, the unintended consequences were more parents left. More parents left the schools, and the schools became poor, and now the resources were, were stretching further. There were now places where schools could close. That doesn't mean more resources. That just means more chaos in children's lives. But the thing that struck out, stuck out most were two statistics that Columbus decided to look at, not the test scores, but the attendance and the graduation rate. Almost half of the students in Columbus did not graduate high school. Um, they did not have enough credits. They dropped out early. Nobody stopped them at the office door and said, why are you leaving? Can we help you somehow? Is it a matter of money? Are you moving? What, what is going on here? And so the spiral started with dropouts. Um, in addition to that, it turned out that um, most of the students were not in school. On any given day, one-third of Columbus students in 2001 were not in school. And I'll go into that a little bit more later. Almost half of the students who were entering kindergarten were not prepared with enough cognitive recognition of letters or even knew their names and their addresses well enough to or could count to 20 to be considered ready for kindergarten. So the, dial, the downward spiral was starting even if, when the child had not even entered into the classroom door. <clears throat> so why did the children do so badly? Well, it certainly, as I said, wasn't the test necessarily. It would be easy to blame them, but a large part was the attendance rate. And it doesn't mean that all students who were absent on a day found that the school was boring or irrelevant. Many high school students stayed home to watch younger brothers or sisters or even their own children. Some children, especially those from African countries, were poorly dressed and could not have enough clothing to walk to school in the winter. Some children, even very young children, stayed at home if the parent had to work to care for an ailing grandmother or elderly relative. Some children, of course, did find life on the streets more exciting, I'm sure, and they could easily get into trouble. But what may surprise you is that the fastest growing population of homeless in the United States is not drug addicts. It is not um, veterans who don't have support systems. It is not alcoholics. It is what is called emancipated youth. This means a young person who is not yet 18 and is not yet legal can, will go to court and say, I have, I have no parents, I have no support system, and it's true, and the court will say, I will now make you, I will emancipate you, I will now make you legally an adult. So they leave foster care system, some of them have been in since they were children, 
in a series of foster homes, or they will leave an abusive home to live on their own with no support systems. They don't even make it six months. Who pays the rent? What, whose car are they living out of? Where do they find food? What income do they have? They are not living safely, and they are not living anything but sadly independently. And so they are the fastest growing population in homeless shelters. And if you are 17 years old and you are a girl, an unwed mother with a baby, and you are legally emancipated and you are perhaps not able to do anything but maybe go to a shelter, the baby is taken from you to go to a foster home. And so what 17-year-old girl is going to say, I'm going to be separated from my baby? And so they resort to many things to be able to stay out of the homeless shelters. In Columbus, we often say that our students do not work jobs to have clothes or iPods. If you have cars, they work to pay the electric bill. And of course, that was when there were jobs. Now, with the economy taking a downturn, the jobs students had at a fast food restaurant like McDonald's now goes to the parent, and the child has no other source of income. So the first decision in Columbus was to do whatever was possible to get students to come to school. And the second was to set a high but hopefully achievable goal. And in 2001, they took the first little children entering school and decided to track them all the way through so that by the time they were juniors ready to be seniors, 90% of them would graduate from school. And this gave rise to the name of the whole reform movement in Columbus called Vision 2012 and Beyond. The graduation rate is inching forward slowly, although one year it did take a small dip. We are very close to 2012 now to know if as juniors they will be able to make this indicator of success, um, but it is only one indicator. What happened next was that many stakeholders in the city, including students, police officers, homeless shelters, um, consultants, parents, came together at the request of the school to develop a mission statement for the school. Mission statements, we all have mission statements. The best mission statements we have found are actually 17 words or less because they are memorable. You can actually remember them to tell somebody them. And so ours was a 22 words, I think, but it reads, each, stu um, each student is highly educated, prepared for leadership and service, and empowered uh, to success as a citizen in a global community. The words were carefully chosen. It was each student, not every student. Um, leadership, service, empower, these were all important values. And citizenship of, uh, the, uh, was important to add in and citizenship of the global economy was chosen because it implied there was a network of us across the world. We have to care about each other. It wasn't necessarily economy and capitalist terms as it was to show that network. And the decision was made to say yeah, global world is rather redundant. Um, still, this was such a product of great involvement, much conversation, and uh, this coming together of people who we would have never expected at the table um, the Board of Education then decided to do what is called an ENDS policy. An ENDS policy is tell us what the student should look like, you people in the community, you students, you parents, and then we will work to make that happen. That is the ENDS. Don't bother us with details. Don't get us off track. Don't change horses in the middle of the stream. We're going forward full steam ahead. And so um, now the digging in began. Please notice, in evaluation, we're still on graduation and attendance. And yes, the third and fifth grade reading scores and math scores were important because they were mandated by the state, but they were not the most important thing. The, the board focused on three areas. Attendance, I've mentioned. Discipline was another. If you are suspended from school, how can you be successful in school? And academic achievement, were you passing from grade to grade? Each year now, and for the last 11 years, there is a card on every single student in Columbus schools, and the parents, the teachers, and the principals sit down at the end of the year to mark, to see what this says. 
Has the child been in trouble? Have they been suspended? Have they been absent a great many days? And this goes on continuously in the course of the school year. At the end of the school year, it forms a profile of the school. And resources are come in, and teachers choose the resources with the principal. It's not as if it comes in and it, it hits you flat. You have the decision as to which professional development and strategies will work. And when we say quality strategies, it is because all of them are tested, all of them have uh, passed my colleagues at universities, they all have data research behind them. And so we know that they are workable and they're workable for students who fit the profile in Columbus. Um, in addition to the vision plan, um, the superintendent of schools made everyone who was at the table. And I want you to imagine the, these tables of people. There is a banker. There is a police officer. There is a low-income resident. There is a student. They made them all decide that they would sign on to the mission statement and make a pledge that they would be willing to be accountable uh, to the achievement of that mission statement. That meant that everyone from Ohio State the president of Ohio State University, down to the banker, down the street, downtown, and to student groups and college students were all willing to take responsibility. What will you do to make this happen? They chose six ways they were going to make, six areas, they call it vision areas. The first four will be no surprise to you. Student achievement and learning, high quality curriculum, instruction, high-quality staff and professional development, partnerships, always good. But the last two may surprise you, school climate and um, effective management of resources. And you might say to yourself, what does that have to do with raising scores and making things better for students and evaluating them? Well, for one thing, uh, school climate refers to wellness and health. So there were now resources that the community brought into every school to make sure that children and staff were, for instance, eating right, eating healthy, eating better. The school board of education itself went to a more healthy structures for lunch, uh, more salad bars, more thinking about healthy eating. And um, mental um, uh, programs for people with uh, really sort of uh, incapacitated mental cognitive ability. Um, we have children, of course, who come to us for, that are the result of fetal alcohol syndrome. Their parents were drug users or their parents were alcoholics, and the child is already starting, in a way, with a great deal against them. So how do you bring this in, not just for the parents, but for the children to bring in resources? Um, this, the uh, idea of effective management resources also travel to um, the transportation system. Um, could the transport, the buses, uh, Columbus buses, if children have to walk more than two miles to school, there is a bus that will take them. And so could those be made more effective? Could the buses run in a slightly different way? Could the schools line up better so that parents knew they could go from this school to this school to this school? And in the first year, they saved almost $2 million. That was $2 million that could go directly to young people and to their needs. They listened to parents and they listened to students about what was still needed in Columbus. There are some very popular programs. I taught at one at an arts and academic high school that was about uh, high math, high science, but also jazz arts, um, music programs, uh, uh, programs in partnership with the Columbus Orchestra, art programs. Parents wanted their child there. It was the only, um, just only school in the district that taught Japanese and Italian in, ad in addition to French and Spanish. So now uh, what they did was they increased the resources so more children could be accepted into those. Two popular and highly successful programs, French and Spanish Immersion, will join together next fall in one building. Uh, they looked at all of the things that parents wanted, including a new international high school, and they started them. And parents, I, I can't say it is a huge wave yet, but parents are returning to Columbus schools, and they are looking again at the options, and that helps to keep the school good for everyone, the school system. Um, 
just to kind of move a, a little bit ahead on some of this, um, my point is, is that evaluation was not about a test score. It was a holistic look at a school system to see where it was deficient. Um, it acknowledged that some students actually needed school because they don't have a home life that is particularly nurturing. School is the refuge for many, many students. And so it fit the peculiar political style of Columbus to be collaborative, to be in discussion, to have many, many voices at the table and to hear them all. From the Muslim parent who says, I want my child to be Americanized as soon as possible, knowing that they themselves will probably never learn English. Uh, my own family on my mother's side were Hungarians. They never thought they could learn English. They considered themselves good, uh, good citizens. They paid taxes, but they never would learn the language. They just felt they were too old. And these Muslim parents are saying, but I want my child to be American. On the other side of town, there is a parent who 40 years ago, their grandparents came to Columbus from the mountains of Appalachia, these are some of the poorest white families, rarely acknowledged in any major city, who came in the 1960s looking for work. And they fear their child will change. They will, are more apt to say, do you want to go to college? Do you think you're better than I am? You're better than I am? They are so fiercely protective of their religion and their family and so fearful of change. They are quite the contrast to the Muslim parents. All these voices needed to be heard in the community and some way to think about how evaluation was going to give them reassurance there was a quality education um, in Columbus. And then there were the downtown businesses. Many times businesses look at themselves as paternalistic. They make the decisions. They know best. You know, where are the new kids coming? Or, you know, where are the new market coming from? But what the downtown business had to admit was the biggest fear they had was people coming to Columbus, going to college, and leaving again. United States, people move all the time, back and forth. They feared a brain drain. And so anything that the Columbus Schools was willing to do to help keep kids educated and on track, they were certainly in favor of. Uh, these small changes and requirements, uh, the looking at something in a much larger picture, uh, were all important. And um, checking my time here. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll work harder at this. Um, there were um, three last points I'd like to make very briefly. Out of almost nowhere came a requirement for our students. And I say that almost out of nowhere because many of us who wanted this for so long thought, how did this happen? Suddenly it's like getting a gift. Students now in high school at each grade level write a, a major research paper uh, on social justice or human welfare. Every single year they have to investigate that globally and locally. It is, a going, it is just starting and it's a real eye-opener. And I attribute the fact to one of our secret weapons is really our superintendent. Nothing happens without good leadership. She doesn't take raises. She is a product of the Columbus schools. Her own childhood neighborhood and neighborhood schools are some of the worst performing and probably most poverty stricken. And in order to bring them more resources, she, she made them STEM academies. STEM, S-T-E-M stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. She knew that what the children really needed were humanities. She's an old humanities teacher. But she brought in STEM to give them the science and math and supplemented it with arts and other programs that balanced that just so they would have the extra resources. And then the last thing that turned out to be sort of a kind of an unbelievable moment was the state of Ohio for decades was out of compliance giving equal money to both rural and urban schools. And so um, you, they were found uh, guilty by the Ohio Supreme Court probably five times. Um, and instead of, you can't send politicians to jail, even if you want to. Um, and so what happened was they made a deal that they would build new schools across Ohio for um, all rural and urban areas. Well, many of the schools, especially in small towns, and I was talking to a woman this morning about village schools, are the pride of the community. 
She called it the heart of the community. And that's how people felt about their old buildings. So when the money was dangled in front of Columbus saying, let's tear down the old buildings and we'll build you new ones with, of course, the magic word technology, um, Columbus said, mm, not so fast. Uh, they did not accept that the state of Ohio's formula that you could not renovate old buildings was a correct one. And so they sat down with historic preservation groups and architects who volunteered their time and others, and they actually proved it was cheaper to renovate the old buildings than to tear down and to build new. And these buildings have again become the pride of the community. And the community came to the table and said, you listened to us, didn't you? Now we can talk about what success means in school. Um, the highest praise on that may come from children themselves. When you walk into these schools, they take you on little tours, and they want to show off their new old building. Um, there is a, uh, a very famous cartoon character that has um, been around for probably 60 years. I've never decided if he was the cross between a pig or a hedgehog or a dog. Uh, and his name is Pogo. And in one very famous cartoon strip, when there was a debate going on, he answered all of the questions by saying, and we have met the enemy, and he is us. And so I kind of ask you, are we the enemy of our own evaluations? And if so, could we make that statement turn around? In fact, could we not ask ourselves, we have met the answer, and it is within us? Thank you. Thank you, Doreen. Tylko dwa zdania wyjaśnienia. Te cztery strumienie tych sesji równoległych prawdopodobnie wyjaśniają się same. Natomiast myślę, że potrzebujecie też państwo wyjaśnienia pomysłu wczorajszego wieczoru, południa i wieczoru dzisiejszego. Wczoraj miało być tu, dzisiaj miało być tu. Wczoraj było, była rozmowa i wykład na temat, jako próba odpowiedzi na pytanie, jak jest, co się dzieje, co nas, co nas warunkuje. Dzisiaj ma być próba odpowiedzi na pytanie, co możemy zrobić, czy jest jakiś pomysł na działanie. Także wczoraj mieliśmy was troszeczkę zdenerwować, a dzisiaj mieliśmy wam dać nadzieję. Dziękuję. Kolacja, pan zapraszam na panel dyskusyjny. Ci z was, którzy wracają na panel dyskusyjny, nie oddawajcie słuchawek.